Welcome to another episode of Living the Dream. I'm your host, Gregory Tucker, and today we have a very special guest, Mr. Brian Ganey. He is a native Daytonian, and at one point in time, he was a volunteer here at the studios we are recording at DATV. Brian, thank you for joining us today, and let's start out with your story. Sure, absolutely. So it is great, uh, Greg, to be back in Dayton, back in the Miami Valley. Thanks for having me on the show. Uh, I had always, as a kid, had an interest in media and radio and television. And I remember when I was about 12 years old, somebody told me about uh, a local public access TV station uh, that you could watch on cable. Uh, at, the, at the time, it was uh, called Access 30 Dayton, but it later was uh, renamed DATV as it is today. And I was told that I could go volunteer at the, the TV station if I, could, if I just took a producer's workshop. And so I was either 12 or 13 years old at the time, very young, and I signed up on, on a Saturday and I went uh, over across the street here on Leo Street at the old building. And I took a day long workshop and learned how to record uh, an event, how to make kind of a little show. And for about three years, uh, 85, 86, 87, I was here just nonstop. I couldn't get enough of it. I loved the process of uh, shooting independent productions and creating TV shows. And I went to a lot of the festivals and things like that in the summer that the station would produce. And I just had just a great time. And I met uh, Melissa, who's the program director here today, uh, who worked here as the receptionist all those years ago. So we've kept in touch. And it, it really was a lot of fun. And I think the only reason that I stopped doing it was I was just beginning high school and I had just so many other responsibilities and so much going on. I was trying to keep my grades up and, and had a job and it just, it became difficult to do everything at once and juggle it. But it, it really was just a very exciting time. And, and this facility and this organization is completely ahead of its time and, and was even then. The idea that me, just a kid in East Dayton, without any money, could just sign up for something like this and come in and be a part of a television station was just amazing. So, yeah, that's kind of my history uh, with DATV. Okay, and what an amazing journey. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to fast forward far as to present day, and that is you are a author, mm -hmm. a motivational speaker, and that is you are a testament far as to perseverance and what determination can do for an individual once they focus on their goal. What do you hope the audience will come away with from your speech at the uh, Nutter Center this week? I, I hope they take away a, a lot from it, Greg. Um, my main reason for doing what I do is to try to to inspire and motivate people to realize that they can do anything if me a normal person which at the time i had nothing and, and all i had was just me weighing almost 600 pounds trying to save my own life if i can just come from nothing and figure it out and figure out how to like you said through perseverance overcome an obstacle like that and, and lose that weight on my own uh, just without any surgery or anything like that. If I can do that, my message to, to the rest of the world and to everybody else is that you can overcome anything, but not in the way that, that most people think. Part of my message is that th the best way to achieve success at anything, and, and it took me a long time, it took me about 20 years to figure this out, so I didn't come to this realization quickly or even overnight. The best way to achieve anything you want to, to achieve wild success beyond anything you ever imagined is through repeated failure, through trying and failing and failing again and making adjustments and learning what doesn't work and doing it again and getting up and dusting off and, and trying it another way and going and meeting somebody and, and talking to people who have been successful at what it is that you're trying to do. And that could be anything. I've spoken to audiences where there's not a single overweight person in the audience. And so my message for people like that is we all have something that we want to do, no matter, no matter what it is. Most people have a job that unfortunately they hate and they go do it every day because they feel like they have to. They have a family to support. They have, they have responsibilities and things like that. And so, and so my message is just 
there is something that, that you are good at that, that if you are holding back on doing it and, and that's a dream that you want to, the only reason it's not happening is because you're just not failing enough. You're not doing anything. You're not, I, I tell people to, to create almost like a failure planner, write down at the top what you really want to do and then list the 10 ways that you're going to fail. But then next to that, list the 10 ways that it just might work. And, and that's, if we look through history, and, and this just, this goes on and on, and, this, and I, this is not me saying this, this is not a new idea. If you look through history, people who have achieved great things, even here in Dayton, the Wright brothers, if you look at people who have achieved great things and gone on to massive success, it has been through repeated, often humiliating failure. How many airplanes did they crash before they finally got one that would take off while everyone was standing around laughing and telling them it couldn't be done? And we, we just look, look at other businesses and just visionary people like Steve Jobs who got fired from the very company he started and was, was a total failure. And, but he didn't quit. He, he came back. He, after the pity party was over, he started to make adjustments. Why did I get fired? What could I do differently? What am I interested in? What are my passions? What are my goals? What, what do I still have to offer the world that excites me every day that, that I can pursue as a goal? So those are kind of some of the things that I talk about and, and try to get people to realize that they can really do anything. It's not easy, but if you're not willing to try and you're not willing to fail, it'll never happen. And just to piggyback on what you said, I have read a quote um, from Thomas Edison. I think it was in Napoleon Hill. Uh-huh. It uh, asked him, he says, uh, uh, what did it take on your way far as to making the discovery of the light bulb? Yeah. He says, well, I tried a thousand things that didn't work until I got to that one thing that did. And that's history right there. And that's why we're able to sit here in this lit room now it's been improved upon since then. And what if he'd quit? Yeah. What if, what if he had tried the light bulb one time or five times or thirty times, and just said, you know what, this just this wasn't meant to be. Mm-hmm. I, I I'm gonna hang it up. I'm done. And he had some of those negative people around him saying, right. yeah, you know what, Thomas, uh, you know the light bulb thing. You know, we've been using candles for years, buddy. You know, get get with the program here. This isn't you're wasting your time. Mm-hmm. You know, what if you listen to those people, those negative forces? And then that would have never happened. So we're all deprived of, of his stuff, of what he brought into the universe to be able to share with and improve humanity. So, mm-hmm. yeah, absolutely. Now, one of the things that I did with my research, part of my research, and that is um, I discovered that you had tried several times mm-hmm. far as to reach your goal of losing weight. Uh, tell us about that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, just as I was talking about failure, I have, I'm an expert, uh, Greg, in failure because I have failed at nearly everything I've ever tried in my life. And I used to think that that was a bad thing. I used to think that because I failed at something, I was a failure. And so I had uh, gained and lost and regained probably thousands of pounds. Uh, I had done all the diets. And then at one point in my 20s, I thought I had it. I really did. I had, I'd gotten up to about 450 pounds and I was sick and tired of being sick and tired. I'd had enough. I was in my twenties. I wanted, I wanted more out of life. And uh, so I proceeded to lose the weight on my own. And, but I was very extreme in my approach, which was just eating as little as possible and exercising several times a day and, and really not a healthy, balanced approach as as I would know now or as probably most people with common sense would know to do. And so I got the weight off. I got all the way down to 200 pounds and I thought it was amazing. I thought here I was my late 20s. I'm 200 pounds. I hadn't weighed that since I was a child. And, and I thought this is amazing. And I had everything except a plan to keep the weight off. Okay. And and so what happened is, is what always happens in that situation is uh, the old line that if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. Uh, well, that was my first lesson in, uh, you know, kind of the score was life one, Brian Ganey zero. And uh, so I gained it all back. And I'm very proud of this accomplishment, actually, because I was able to gain all of it back faster than I lost it, which was quite amazing, actually, to lose 250 pounds in about 11 months, but to gain it all back in about nine. And so that was just the most depressing thing I've ever lived through. And it was also humiliating because when you lose a whole bunch of weight and then you gain it back, it's all very public. People are seeing it happen right in front of them. They, they're seeing, they're like, my goodness, look at him. He walked around here like he had all the answers and I had a big head. 
and uh, I would tell anyone that would listen how amazing I was and look what I've done. And if and I would tell people that were losing weight, they were doing it wrong because my way was the best. Mm -hmm. And so I became that annoying person, but then I gained it all back and it was very depressing. And that set off about a 10 year, really just kind of a depression, just lost in the wilderness. And that's all I gave up. I just said, you know what? You know, like we were just talking about Thomas Edison giving up on the light bulb. I just gave up. I thought I'm just, I'm meant to be heavy. I was the, you know, I would say what a lot of people say, which is I'm just going to die fat and happy. <laughs> I'll just eat whatever I want, do whatever I want. And um, I, I don't know how far you want me to go in the story, but, but that, that all changed when I wound up in the hospital. Uh -huh. And, and that goes into, that kind of segues into the turning point mm -hmm. uh, where you have found that as far as all the quick fixes or the immediate gratification uh, didn't work out for you. Uh, at one point you had considered or you did not consider as far as the surgery? Yeah, absolutely. When I had, uh, I didn't know what was happening to me in 2010 when I was rushed to the hospital. Uh, all I knew was I couldn't breathe. And I had no idea what I weighed. Um, but I'm in the hospital and they finally figure out what the problem is, which is uh, it was called a pulmonary embolism. It's where blood clots form in your in your body, usually your legs and travel to your lungs and, and cut off your oxygen. And about one in four cases, it's fatal. People just die instantly uh, or the blood clot travels to your brain and you have a stroke and die or something bad happens. And and I, I didn't. I, I didn't know what was happening, but I knew something had to be done. But the entire time I was in the hospital, to answer your question, I was offered the weight loss surgery. And at the time, and I still do, um, my day job that I have uh, has excellent health insurance. Yep. And so when the doctors would come into the hospital room and they would see me there at what I later found out was almost 600 pounds, they would, they would see that. And when you see somebody in that situation, they would immediately offer me the weight loss surgery. And I had doctors that would tell me that they had already called the insurance company, that it had been approved okay. and, and that it would cost me hardly anything. And that after all this was over, they could wheel me down the hallway and I could have the weight loss surgery. But I'll tell you, Greg, why I didn't do it. And, and this is, I want everyone who's watching and listening to, to know this because a lot of people have weight loss surgery. I take nothing away from that. I don't judge anyone. It wasn't the right choice for me. And, th and the reason why is because I knew just from past experience and from my personality type and how I am, I knew that if I did something like that, that I would be surgically be, I would be being made to lose the weight. I would be being forced. So the size of my stomach is going to be reduced to the size of a golf ball. And, and now I'm, I have to do it. Okay. And I had also had a lot of friends. I've had friends that have had success with the weight loss surgery. And I have had friends that have sadly gained all the weight back. And so I'm looking at it again from Brian Ganey's perspective through my personal lens. And I'm like, okay, if it's possible, one, to cheat the system and still gain the weight back, then, then I can see me doing that. And then if I also know that I have to, after I lose the weight, if I have to work hard to keep it off anyway, at that point, I'm like, I'm like, it just, it was crystal clear to me. I just, I knew that wasn't for me. I knew it's not what I wanted to do. I also had other health problems that made it a significant risk where I might have, have uh, not survived the surgery. So it just made it an easy decision. And that's when I decided I have to do things my own way. And I had no idea what that way was. Okay. Um, just like we were talking about making adjustments, you know, the invention of the airplane, the light bulb, the computer, you just know what doesn't work. You don't know what okay. does work. You just know you got to change something. So that's that's where I was. Okay. And, and, and that I used a lot of analogies. Or, I do too, or, yeah. Or coming back to reading uh, Jim Rowan, yeah. uh, a motivational speaker. I know Jim well, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, Jim's passed away, but uh -huh. I'm familiar with his work. <laughs> and one of the things he says when you're looking for change – Change begins with changing yourself. That's yes. how it's going to uh, accomplish change right there. Now, with that, um, one of the other titles that I didn't mention, and that is because you're an author, you're an entrepreneur as well. Yeah. Okay. Uh, tell us about your book. Sure, sure. So this is the book. So uh, I called the book uh, Impossible because when I got out of the hospital, I asked a doctor, um, they're standing there again, offering me the weight loss surgery. 
uh, going through the risk factors, you weigh almost 600 pounds. This is at the time I was 37 years old. You're not going to live very long. You have all of these complications. Um, the things didn't look good. And I don't fault them for that. Um, the naysayers are never wrong. They're just going by what they see. And, but what they don't have is they don't have your belief system, your drive, your passion. They don't, they're not you. They don't look at the things the way you do, and they don't know what you're capable of because they don't see that. Okay. So they see 600-pound Brian Ganey, and they're looking at him statistically what could happen. So, um, but I asked him after he made the, the weight loss surgery pitch. I said, uh, I said well, listen, I, I know about the weight loss surgery. Everybody's offered me that. But, but what if I were to just eat less food and and try to get some exercise what if i what if i just tried that do you do you think that that might be a thing i could do and he told me at the time he said well you know doing it on your own would just be impossible it would it would take you years to lose it you have hundreds of pounds to lose it would take years it just it would be impossible and i remember thinking at the time not that i wanted to come back and show him because i've never seen him again and i don't care uh i never did this to prove anybody right or wrong but I remember thinking at the time that that would make a great book title, that <laughs> if somehow, some way I'm able to lose, and I never thought I would lose all of it, but if I could lose some of this weight, maybe I would share it with the world. So, so that's, that's the book, Impossible. Uh, I, I wrote it. This is the new uh, large print edition, and it's available on Amazon.com and also my website, uh, BrianGainey.com, if people want a signed copy. Okay. So, the, so that's the book. Okay. Now, the uh, driving force or for writing the book mm -hmm. because I know that's going into a whole different area as far as writing. What are some of the challenges you found when you were uh, writing your story? Or the, the biggest challenge is what you just said, writing my story. So I've always, being a heavy child and a heavy kid throughout um, my life and, and early adulthood, I've always been, a, had up to that point, been a private, shy, quiet person um, about myself. Now, I had after after I volunteered at DATV when I was a kid, I went on to work in the radio business. Uh, so I, I was used to audiences and speaking in front of people, but not really ever about myself and certainly never about personal struggles or personal failings. So that 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 was a lot different. So that was the hardest part was was talking about it and just sharing information that's deeply personal, being willing to tell people and audiences and, and in this book being able to say that I have a that I have a problem with food. My relationship with food is broken. I, I have a food addiction. I I don't know what's I have a screw loose when it comes to eating. There's something wrong with me. And and being able to admit that and share that. But the the driving force behind writing this is I had while I was going through the weight loss journey, I started writing a blog online and I would just every couple of days I would share what I was going through, what the struggles were. Um you know, I'd gotten on the scale, the number had gone up, and I never shared that blog with anyone. I wrote it for six months just for myself. And then I finally shared it with the world, and a lot of people said, this is, this is really good. This would make a good book. Okay. And, and so I thought, and, and I began to hear from people that would read the blog, and, and not that, that they read the blog and, and went out and lost a whole bunch of weight, although there are people like that, that people would just get, they would pull certain things out of it. I would hear from people that were struggling with addictions to drugs and alcohol, or maybe they were stuck in a bad relationship and they had never just felt like it was possible to get out. And they're, they're reading my story about a guy doing what I'm doing. And they're thinking, well, if he can do that, I can do anything. And I remember hearing from someone who quit smoking after they had read my blog. So I, I thought, well, this could help people. So that, that was what, what got me started was I'm going to share all this information about myself, which, a lot of which is embarrassing, but because it could help somebody. And, and that's why I do what I do. It's why I do the motivational speaking. It's why I stand up in front of groups of people and talk about myself is because if I can reach one person, and you hear this a lot, but it really is true. If there's one person or two people or somebody, or I do podcasts and shows like this, if there's somebody out there that, that sees this and it resonates with them, then I've helped somebody and I can die a happy man at that point. So th that's why I wrote the book. Okay. So I, I see that there's passion for us in telling a story, for us in helping others change their uh, outcomes. And it's a good point that you brought up, and that is food addiction. Mm -hmm. Or it's just like any other addiction. Um, and that is it's something that just doesn't go away, 
just because you've met that goal as far as of losing weight or even far as say with the person who drinks um, they've stopped drinking they've what haven't drunk in probably a year or so for it doesn't mean that that urge does not still uh, resurface at times of stress but um, one of the uh, things far as when you went into because living the dream is about entrepreneurs also and awesome. inspiration and motivation um, what are some of the challenges as far as in publishing that you found oh my goodness that's that's a great <laughs> question and and I love entrepreneurship and I love being an entrepreneur um, so the the challenges are everything so I self-published this book and the great thing that is the great democracy right now is anyone the internet has enabled us to do anything so if if you have a good idea or if you have a book you can put it out there and it doesn't cost very there's not a big uh, barrier to doing so anyone can go through Amazon and their self-publishing side and you can create the book yourself and the software and the templates are all free to download and you can make it the one thing that I've learned is most self-published books sell less than 500 copies most people self-publish a book and they go here's my book and they sell it to all their friends and family and anybody they can and they share it on Facebook and and, and maybe that's enough for them maybe it's just <laughs> enough to say I wrote the book take it off the bucket list uh, now I'm done the re and most books honestly even published books through big publishing houses also fail uh, and don't sell a lot of copies either the one thing that I have learned, and this is going to help me as I go forward to the next book and, and move on down the line, is everything comes down to the promotion. So it's, it's your book, but the success or failure of the book is you. So your ability to do media to promote your book, how many Twitter followers and Facebook followers and Instagram followers, how, many, how, how are you able to impact uh, promoting your book, your product, on social and how can you get out the word and in in my case the the book becomes the merchandise when I do um, motivational speeches and public speaking and events uh, people who want to know more or people want to learn more they're able to uh, interact with me and get a selfie and have me sign their book and so I become as the entrepreneur I become the I, I don't want I guess the entertainer and and this is the this is the the, the program, the merchandise, the, the extension of the brand, so to speak. So that, that's the one thing people don't think of is they publish the book and you have the book and congratulations. And it could be a great book, mm -hmm. but, but the, the success or failure of the book is going to depend on you. And, and that's the only way or reason that anyone's going to care about the book is your ability to generate publicity and interest in the book. Um, there are a lot of things that I've learned um, – Unless you're a fairly well-known author, things like book signings are, are generally a waste of time. And, and that's what people think of. But if, if you set up a little table at a bookstore for a couple of hours and talk to five people and two of them buy your book, you're not impacting what you could be impacting. Right. You, could share, you could share a story about your book on Facebook or Instagram and you could put the right hashtag in there and thousands of people could read that. And you could sell hundreds of books that way. Okay. So it's, it really comes down to the promotion. That would, that would be the thing. The actual doing it, yes, it's, it's very tedious. I would recommend people have a good editor, somebody else to read it, and somebody who's willing to tell you if it's bad or it needs to be fixed. No. Um, so you want to have a good book. You want to have a good product. But your ability to promote it is everything. If you can get on TV, uh, mm -hmm. as I've been fortunate enough to do, if you can send your book to some any famous people mm -hmm. uh, on the subject matter, if it's a motivational speaking book, excuse me, if it's a motivational speaking book, if you can get that in the hands of another motivational speaker who can give you a quote that you could put on it, it's just you have to promote. You've got to get into that mindset of, of being a self-promoter. Okay. And one of the things that I find um, really interesting about your story, and that is – how transferable it is, not just for uh, those who are looking to lose weight, but that could be far as for sales organization, as sure. far as for that salesperson or whomever that are running into those struggles right there 
and that is it's those basic principles and that is planning your work and working your plan and being focused as far as on what you're trying to accomplish and then willing to understand that it's not going to be a quick fix or an overnight success because it took you planning and you had to go through a lot of perseverance in order to reach your goal. So have you gotten any uh, corporations uh, contacting you? Uh, absolutely. And that's what I enjoy the most. It's, it's a great challenge when I'm presented with an audience or when I'm hired for a purpose to speak to a group of people and nobody has any weight to lose. They, they, they don't want me for healthy eating tips. They want me to help their salespeople improve their numbers or they want me to teach a group of people that are going to be working on a project how they can work better together or they just want to be motivated in general and it's all transferable it really is just it's it's kind of like project management it doesn't matter what you're doing it's the organization the perseverance the being able to stick to it but i tell you the biggest thing if i could if i could give people one thing and that's this it's do something different so if you have somebody who is in sales and that's a that's a doggy dog world if if you sell you make money you're great you're successful if you don't you're fired so if if you're not experiencing the results that you want and this is anything do something different just do something different everything you've been doing up to that point has brought you to the point that you're at so what can you do that's different it's it's those adjustments and just get right back to it get right back to it. The other thing, and it's, it's perfectly transferable to sales because I've failed so much. And even on this journey, I've failed so much. It, it looks like when people see the picture with, with the big pants, they think it must have just all been nonstop success. But what they don't know is that I had weeks and months where I couldn't lose any weight to save my life. Or I would exercise and eat right and then gain weight. And it was maddening. But, but what I learned is I just have to try something different a different approach and it's like people complaining that they that they don't that they can't find somebody to go out on a date with it's like well how many people have you asked and it, and that's that's really that knocking on doors approach how many people have you asked how many no's have you have you received and and so that's what I tell salespeople is when you wake up and you go to the wherever you do whatever it is that you do how many no's are you gonna get today and you're going to thank every per everybody that tells you no, because every no that you get is one more closer to that yes. And you might have to get 100 people to tell you no. And the more no's you get, you're going to think, wow, that thing I just did got me a no. So I won't do that again. Or maybe I'll make this adjustment. Or maybe it was that type of customer that told me no using that particular approach. So now I'm going to try it on somebody else and see if it works. Well, it doesn't work there either. So maybe I'll do something different. And, and so that, that helps me when I speak to, to, to sales organizations. And it, it, it really is the same for everybody when it comes to things like weight loss and, and motivation in general. Whether people have a lot of weight to lose or need to stop smoking or whatever it is, they, they have ideas and dreams and goals and things that they wish that they could do, but they're not doing them because they don't think it's possible. But, but the sad thing about it, the, the very sad thing about it, Greg, is that they're just, they're not trying. It's like people will come to me all the time and say, I can't lose any weight, I've tried everything. And it sounds good to say it, but I'll tell them I don't believe you. Because what you did probably is you tried one thing and it didn't work and you gave up and now you're going around telling everybody I tried everything. Well, everything is not just you went and bought a bunch of frozen diet dinners and ate them all in three hours and nothing happened. It, you know, you, you've got to be willing to make multiple <laughs> attempts and keep trying and keep trying. Mm -hmm. and, and that's as old as the hills. Uh -huh. and, th and that's where it comes to that quick or that instant fix yeah. because we're kind of like in that phase right now or in an era far as where everything has to be instantaneous yeah. or else it's not working. I uh, heard a uh, another guest we had had um, it made the statement that a lot of times people see the beginning and they see the end result, but they don't see the journey. And that's where you really learn is through the course of the journey. Because as you mentioned, that is you're failing. But 
not looking at it as failure, but looking at it as an opportunity to learn what does not work. Yeah, absolutely. There are, I, I try to, and I'm going to be speaking to, I, I'm, think, I'm guessing a lot of students at Wright State on Friday, and I try to tell them, look at, look at your social media feed, and, and you're going to see the stars, and, and they look very successful. And you see somebody like Jay-Z, who's just liter- worth billions of dollars, top of the entertainment world. And you think, maybe even subconsciously, but you think that it just happened. He's a talented guy, and he woke up one day with all that money. But what they don't see is that he used to be broker than you are, and he had nothing. And people told him no, and told him he didn't have any talent, and no one's going to listen to that. And, and you, you get out of here. You can't rap. No one's going no to buy that. That's, that. That music went out a long time ago. You know, go get yourself a good job and, and, it'll be, and you'll be okay. Get out of my office and stop wasting my time. That's what they don't see. They, don't real, they see Michael Jordan with six NBA championships and the greatest of all time, but they don't see him being cut from his high school basketball team and told to go get a job because this isn't for you, kid. Uh, all that. And, and they, they just don't see that. They, they, we see, and, and this is the unfortunate side effect of, like you said, the, the culture that we live in where it's instant gratification, where people, people, I love social media, don't get me wrong, but it, it really does, it really perpetuates a lie when you look at that feed that everything is amazing everywhere because that's what we all try to put out there. I mean, I'm guilty of it. I'll, after I leave here today, I'll put pictures of it and people will see it and they go, wow, man, that guy's got everything going on. Look at that. He's going to be famous someday. And this is amazing. And he's living the dream. But they don't, they don't just see the struggles and the hardships. And, and I would, when, even when I would post pictures of, of me, you know, hey, guys, I've lost 100 pounds. Look at this. And like, wow, man, you're amazing. This is, and I almost had a, had a somewhat negative reaction to that because I knew that it was giving people the impression that it was easy and, and, it, and it's not. And, and so I try to make people see that and I try to, to make them understand what you're gonna have to go through. Mm-hmm. And, and that's why I love to talk about failure because you're going, and, and the, it's the Healthy Eating Club at Wright State that's brought me here. And so mm-hmm. I'll have to talk about healthy eating tips and things like that. And I tell people, you're gonna overeat again, it's gonna happen. You're gonna have bad days. You're going to go on a trip that you didn't expect, and you're going to come back three pounds fatter than before you left. But what that doesn't mean is that doesn't mean that you've lost or that you're a failure or that the whole thing, you might as well just give up and just go eat a whole, pi- you know, a whole pizza or what. That just, that's just what happened that day or that week. And so now we get back on the horse and we keep it moving. And, and that's, that's the hardest thing for people to understand. But, yeah, the quick fix is, and, and I, in this book, I, uh, I was very passionate about being very upset with the weight loss industry when I wrote this book because I, f- I feel like people are really lied to. And, and I know that's kind of a, a sort of an extreme controversial thing to say, but it's the marketing of the quick fix. <laughs> and it's it billions and b- <laughs> great billions and billions of dollars are spent on what is essentially a lie. Because yes, all the diets work. Every last one of them. Oh, yes. You will lose weight. It's going to happen. <laughs> But I mean, where does that leave you? Other than just without the money you paid for the diet, you you have you have to have a plan moving forward of what you're going to do. So yeah, the the quick fix is is a thing in, in life. Um, I mean, we teach children from a young age when they're going to ride a bicycle. What do we teach them? We teach them you fall off, you get back on, and it, it hurts and it's terrible. And, and you, get, you get on it again, knowing you're going to fall back off. But we stand there. We teach children a lesson that we forget ourselves. <laughs> we, we forget. So we, we tell them to do it, and then we don't go do it. Because we fall off in our life, and we go, oh, well, they must be right. I don't have any talent, or I, I'm, I'm not a good employee, or I'm a bad person, so they must be right. And so we don't get back on the bike. So that's, that's a long answer to your question. Okay. Well... It's, I know you have a long day still ahead of you because you have some other engagements. Um, we do appreciate you taking the time for us to come and share your story for us with us. Uh, one thing we always like to ask our guests, and that is, what would you like to tell the entrepreneur out there who is struggling? What would be some of your suggestions Oh boy, that's a great question. I, I've learned because I've started a few businesses and they've failed. Um, so I, there are some things I can share. 
I think the first thing for anybody who wants to get into anything, whatever it is you want to do, whatever business you want to start, uh, it is essential to find a mentor. So you, you must, as fast as you can, find someone who is doing what you want to do okay. and hopefully doing it well. And then you need to become their new best friend. So you need to get all up in their stuff and ask them outright, will you be my mentor? Uh, I want to learn as much as I can from you. Buy them lunch, hang out with them, see what they're doing, figure out how you can be successful like they are. So mentoring is an amazing thing. Networking is essential. And, and I, I say these things because these are things that don't really cost much. Um, if there's something you want to do or a business you want to start, it's just essential to find someone that's already doing it to see what you can learn from them. Uh, books are a great resource. If there's a business that you want to start, read books. And it doesn't even have to be in the business that, that you, that, that you, that, that it doesn't have to be a book about the business that you want to do. You can, you could be wanting to start a lemonade stand and you could learn a whole lot about how to be successful from a book about Henry Ford. You know, anybody like that, that's successful in business. So be open-minded, read, find a mentor. And then here's one more thing. Don't spend a bunch of money. So I've, I've started, a, I started a business a while ago where I thought it was gonna be so amazingly su successful that I went out and I spent a whole bunch of money trying to get it started and then nothing happened, which, is, which was one of those things that's always gonna happen. It was a failure, but, uh, or I should say it failed. Um, and I learned from that. But in, in retrospect, run everything on a shoestring until it takes off. So that, that would be my thing. If, if you want to start a podcast, do it as cheaply as possible. Go sit in your car with your iPad and your, your earbuds and just start talking into it and put it on the internet and start to slowly build an audience you know, organically. Um, so yeah, run it on a shoestring. Just be hungry, be hungry, meet people, have mentors. And, and none of this, none of what I just said in answering your question is gonna happen if you're sitting in your house. You've got to get out. You've got to meet people. I know that, that being social and networking is somewhat of a lost art, but, I, but I'm telling you, the more you do it, the, the, you can, if you can get in the right place at the right time around the right people and, and people take an interest in you, and, and a lot of people, a lot of very successful people will help you if you just ask. You can say, hey, I have an interest in doing X. Can I just come? Can I just come watch you do it and just uh, see what it's like and see how you do it? And you will pick up so much information and so much knowledge by by seeing other people. So those would be kind of some of my tips for anybody looking to get in any line of work. Okay. Well, I thank you very much. Thank and you. <laughs> oh, it's been a, a pleasure. Thank you so much. I'm quite Greg. sure that you, this story, your story, definitely will change someone's outlook or their life. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. And uh, this is an amazing show, an amazing facility. Thank you so much. It's great to be back in Dayton. Okay. And with that, folks, thank you for tuning in to another episode of Living the Dream. And remember, we want to hear your story. One other thing that we'd like to add, and that is the next person that you meet, say hi and smile because you never know what battle. Thank you.